Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Childhood Functional Programming Seminar. This week, we're delighted to have Robbie Findlay with us from Northwestern University. Uh, Robbie is very well known for his work on Racket and Contracts and Redex. And uh, this week, he's going to tell us about concolic testing. So, Robbie, over to you. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks also to uh, Mary and Kuhn for having me here and everyone for joining. It's really something in our modern age, the way we do these things. All right, so I wanna to talk to you today about concolic testing. Um, some of you know about concolic testing already. Um, and so the beginning of this talk will be a little bit of a refresher, but also a notational um, introduction to the way I write programs. Um, but before we get there, let me just say a little bit about what concolic testing is um, generally. So it's a bug finding technique. You have some software and you need some fact to be true of your software. So for example, a nice fact might be that it doesn't crash. <laughs> or you might have two implementations of effectively the same function and you might wanna compare and make sure that they actually do behave the same way. And that might sound a little weird, but um, they're actually all over the place. So for example, your compiler, if you change the optimization level is running different piles of code. And so it might be nice to know that the compiler in different optimization levels behaves the same way. And there's other kinds of properties you might wish to be true that are somehow more specific to the particular program at hand. So you start with one of those and then you ask the concolic tester to try to falsify that property. And concolic tester will explore the behavior of your program by sort of running it, watching what it's doing, taking account of how it did various things, and then sort of changing the input in a way that will force it to do different things in an effort to try to falsify this property. And it's very clever about the way it does it. And that's mostly what we're gonna be talking about today is how we can be more clever, in fact. Um, so this dates back to 2005 the direct technical thing I'm gonna be talking about calling and call testing and more broadly kind of goes back to the early seventies when people were studying symbolic execution. All right, so what I wanna talk about today is higher order concolic testing. So we're gonna to try to generalize the basic idea of concolic testing to support programs whose inputs are functions. And of course, when I say that, you know, no complete program has input that's a function, but um, Instead, we were thinking maybe about libraries and being able to use the same ideas about finding bugs in libraries um, using concolic testing as we can with whole programs when the inputs are only first order. And I also wanna emphasize what I'm gonna to present to you today is an idea, a way to think about what higher order concolic testing means. And the results that we actually have about this are theoretical. And in particular, the, the main or um, one of the most important results we have about the work that I'm going to present today is a, a notion of completeness. And the idea being that we can somehow say that if there is a bug in this program that accepts higher order inputs, then the process I'm going to describe for the rest of this hour can find that bug. Okay, so that's going to help guide us through as we talk about, um, uh, as we talk about higher order concolic testing. Okay, so I'll start by just talking about concolic execution, a la those two, that work in 2005, um, to get us warmed up and to get us sort of used to the notations I'm going to use. So you can read the code that will be on the slides. Um, and also this, you see this purple bar here on the screen, that's um, there's sort of a bunch of chapters that we'll go through. And at each of those points, I'll, I'll take a look and see if there's any questions on the Slido. Um, okay. All right. So. Here's concolic testing in a nutshell. Um, so we start with the program and you see in that box there, X colon integer, those are gonna be the inputs to the program. I'll always put them in a box and, and just put their types on them like that. And um, then there'll be a program just below that has a bunch of free variables in it that are those inputs. So in this case, X. And for our first example, um, I've put a, the, the very silly control flow graph of this program in the upper right corner there next to my face. So you can see that this is a program that makes some decision. And then if that decision goes one way, it'll return an 11. So in that particular, if that decision, if it produces a false, we're gonna get an 11. And you can see in the code else 11 on the last line there, that sort of corresponds to taking that right branch. And then if we take the left branch, um, that means we got a true uh, for that first decision. And then we'll have another inner branch that will go either to an error or to 12. Okay, so here's one of the, the, the main, one of the two main parts of what concolic testing means. 
is that it, we can run the program in a not so normal way. In particular, we can sort of track how the inputs affected the other values that show up during the computation. Okay, this is the big, the big magic hammer that concolic testing gives us and what's gonna be the, the, kind of the tool, the main tool that we're gonna use to be able to find new behavior in the program. So of course the, the concolic tester doesn't know that that, um, that tree up there is the control flow graph of this program. Um, it, it hasn't even discovered that first node yet. So, but what it will do is it will start running the program with zero as the input, zero for X. And you see, I've, um, so I've replaced all the X's with zeros, but you see that there's also a superscript red X on them. And that's the, that's the extra special thing that we need the concolic testing engine to be able to do. So we're running programs in a totally different way than we would normally run them, but it's a, it's a way that records information about what happened in the program. It doesn't actually change the way the program would run. Okay, so let's talk about how we evaluate this program. It's a conditional expression. And in order to evaluate a conditional expression, you have to evaluate the test position of it. And the test position is that thing that starts with the equal sign there. So it's a big arithmetic expression. And if we get a true, we're gonna to go to the inner cond and then have to make some other decision. And if we get a false, we're gonna get an 11. So you probably already see we're gonna get a false, but let's see how we get that false. All right, so in order to evaluate that arithmetic expression, we have to, the first thing we have to do, because we work from the inside out to evaluate arithmetic expressions, is we have to multiply zero times zero, which of course is gonna be zero. But now you see that this zero is a different zero than the other zero that we have sitting next to it because this zero was computed by squaring the input. And so the concolic engine keeps track of that through these little superscripts um, on the values. So there's more than one zero in the program and the concolic engine has to be able to be aware of these zeros and sort of keep track about what's happening with the zeros as we go or the various values that are influenced by the input. Okay, so now we can, we're ready to do the subtraction expression. So zero minus zero minus 992 is of course gonna be equal to negative 992 but this isn't just any old negative 992. It's the one we get by squaring the input, um, subtracting the input, and then subtracting 992. Uh, okay, and then that's, uh, that's gonna be equal to zero um, if, the, if the branch is to go true. Uh, of course it's not, so what we get is a false there. Um, and this is a false that's uh, got that equation as what controls the fact that it ended up being a false relative to the inputs. So the, this program is gonna produce an 11, but uh, when not find a bug, but the concolic tester has now noticed that we've gone through a cond. So in addition to keeping track of the provenance of these values, it also records um, when control flow decisions were made, what was the formula that affected the control flow decision? So, so it's sort of, what just happened is it discovered the, uh, the fact that there is that top node in the control flow graph of this program. All right. Um, and so we get an 11, so we didn't find the bug. So the concolic testing engine now will now try again. And this is what happens when you're running with uh, concolic testing is you run over and over and over and over again. And uh, um, taking into account what you learned about the control flow decisions that were made and then trying to make different ones. And how do you make a different decision? Well, you use an SMT solver. So we'll give this formula to the SMT solver. It's x squared minus x minus 992 equal to zero. And we'll, we know that last time we took the false branch. So this time we want an x that makes that formula true. And the SMT solver will say 32. So we'll get the program back again. We'll plug in 32 this time and uh, start the evaluation process over again. So again, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna square 32, which gives us 1024. And you won't be surprised to learn 1024 minus 32 minus 992 equals to zero. And this is yet another zero. This is a zero that was um, computed by squaring the input, subtracting the input, and then subtracting 992. This time we get a true. And again, we hit that same con branch. We have the same provenance, which means things are working. And, uh, but this time we take the true branch. So I'm gonna show taking the true branch by basically just deleting the outer cond because it's no longer relevant to the program. So now we have the inner cond here. And the first thing it asks is whether or not the input is less than zero, whether 32 is less than zero, and it's not. Um, so we get false again. And then, 
Um, this time our false is saying x less than zero. And so we, we've now discovered a second node in the control flow graph. And so we can, um, you know, the program terminates with 12, but we can take these two formulas and then ask the SMT solver for a solution to them that holds for both of them. And we'll come back and say negative 31 is the solution that holds for both of them. And then we'll run the program again and we'll get to the error. Okay, so uh, to recap, this is the, the essential idea of concolic testing. We're gonna track how values are computed and how they influence the program, other values in the program. We'll log values that influence the control flow decisions. So in the rest of the talk and this little setup, it's always gonna be conned, but there are other places where control flow is influenced by values during the execution in various other programming languages. So we'll just track all those. And then we use a solver to try to get us to go in different ways through the program. All right, so that's the basics of concolic testing. I see there's a couple of questions here. Um, is this white box testing and not? Yes, this is white box testing. Um, the type of the function is known beforehand. Um, the, the, in the setup in the talk, the, the type of the inputs is known beforehand. And I'm doing that mostly as a device so that we can um, worry a little bit less about fiddly details, but that's not essential to what we're talking about here. Um, okay. Uh, I take advantage of the fact that I, the type is known to sort of eliminate certain possible inputs as valid to the, to the, to the program just to make certain points about what will happen when we're solving. You'll, you'll see. But it's not essential to, to what I'm talking about. All right. OK, now on to concolic testing, higher order concolic testing. And first, we'll spend um, a fair amount of time, actually, and we'll focus in on um, a function, functions that just map from integers to integers. And there's a lot of stuff going on here we'll need to understand to be able to really generalize to the to fully higher order case. So to get us going, functions that are first order, but they're inputs to the program. All right. Um, is this more powerful than something like AFL? That's, this is a theoretical development. AFL finds actual bugs in your programs. So I'll go with yes and no <laughs> as an answer to that question. OK. Um, the, the, uh, OK, so new, new, new program, new conditional expression. And the test part of this conditional expression is going to show up a bunch in, in, in sort of minor variations in the next few examples. So let's take a moment to look at it. What it's saying here is that we want to find an f if we want to find the bug in this program, we need an f such so as f of 1 times 3 is equal to f of 2 plus 3. Okay? And here's one f that satisfies those conditions. Let's sort of walk through how this program would evaluate. So we see that f, we see the two calls to f, so we can go ahead and substitute, do the substitution and replace the calls to f with the bodies of f where the argument is plugged in for x. And if we do that, we get this expression. So we've got two minus one, um, where the first call to f was, and two minus two, where the second call to f was. And now we can do those two pieces of arithmetic and end up with one and zero in those places. And now we get three times one should be equal to three plus zero, or zero plus three, which is, of course, true. So we get to an error. All right. So in order for us to, um, in order for us to understand how we sort of think about, how we, the authors of this work, think about higher concolic testing, um, I need to sort of introduce uh, one idea here, which I'll then try to explain through the rest of the talk. And the idea is we wanna make a distinction between the strategy that the function um, that's the input to the program is taking, sort of what is it doing somehow, and then the, the solver. And the, these two parts need to cooperate somehow with each other. So we had all this information that we recorded that there was a provenance of the values in the program as it was running. And um, <laughs> excuse me. And, and we took we saved that information and used it with the solver. And now the thing that we're adding is that the, the input can itself have some behavior and it can make some decisions. And we're going to call that the strategy of what it's doing. Okay. And one point to, to be clear here is that when we have a first order function, there's really sort of a degenerate case of the strategies that are possible. 
And there's really, there's really only one interesting strategy. Even though there's many ways you could write a first order function that might compute its inputs from its outputs in lots of different and interesting ways. There's really only one strategy that it's relevant here, which is that the function kind of boils down to a table. So if you look at this Lambda expression here, you can see like, oh, if I were to pass in 17, that function returns negative 15, but that is totally irrelevant for the purpose of finding this particular bug. All that really mattered is that one mapped to one and two mapped to zero. And none of the other inputs were actually used. So if I pass in a string to this function, the fact that it gives me an error message involving subtraction is also irrelevant to this program. So really with the first order functions, all we care about them is that, is that they, they, have, they have some influence on the program because of the way they map the inputs that the function, that the program we're testing actually supplies to that function. Okay, so so that's how the concala tester is going to start. It's going to start with the stupidest possible map, which is one that just maps everything to, to the same value. But it's not just going to be a constant value that we're going to return here from this function. We're going to return a constant value that we're going to treat as one of these special values that we can sort of see how it influences the control flow in the program. So I have this function f. It takes in its argument, which it then ignores, and then it returns 0 as the input x, not just any zero, but zero that is the input x. Okay. Um, all right, so let's, let's see how this program runs. So uh, f of one and f of two are both gonna be zero as x is, and then we can multiply in the addition and do this, and then we can see that that zero is not equal to three, so therefore we get a false back, and x times three equals x plus three is the, is the symbolic expression that, if, that controls the control flow somehow with this particular input f. All right, so let's look at that for a moment. We need an x such that x times three equals x plus three. And of course, if you subtract x from both sides, you, we, need an x times, we need an x such that x times two equals three, and there aren't any. <laughs> so are we in trouble? Well, no, I hope not, right? As we talked about, we're aiming for a kind of a completeness result here. And we know there's an input that finds a bug in this program. So we're missing a piece and that piece is kind of a log, okay? So just like we logged the control flow decisions that were made by the program as it, run, as it ran, we're also going to log the values that are supplied to the input. And if we do that, we're gonna see that one is supplied and then two is supplied. And then that gives us a new action. In addition to flipping the control flow branches in the program as it was running, we are attempting to flip them by changing the inputs. We can also introduce cond expressions, that is build that table that I talked about that's essential for, the, that's sort of the essence of, of first order functions based on the log that we got in the first run. So we know that we got one and then we got two, so we can insert a cond that looks like this. So now this function f still is a constant function zero, but it's the constant function zero where we have two different zeros because we can take advantage of the fact that we can have two different um, variables that start out as the superscripts, y and z. All right, so let's see how this plays out. So if we do f of one, that's gonna be zero with a y. And then if we do f of two, that's gonna be zero uh, with a z on it. And now if we just do the same steps we've done several times now, we'll get false, but this time we'll get false with a different formula. We'll get false with y times three equals to z plus three. And this formula has solutions and the solver will tell us set y to one and z to zero. And now um, we find the bug in the program and we've discovered the exact table that mattered from earlier. All right, so the lessons here in this chapter were you have to log the values that come in from the program under test. And then we can use cons to actually send in multiple different symbolic variables. And that multiple different symbolic variables leads us to sort of more relaxed formulas, which we might have a better chance of being able to solve. Okay, so let me look at the questions. Uh, do you record say square root as a primitive op as you did for the product? And do you look at the trace? Yeah, so, um, that sort of depends on your solver. So if your solver has understands what square root is, then you want to log square root as square root so you can tell it to the solver. And if not, you might uh, you you know you might try to do something with the bowels of the square root function. Um, so this came up in a prototype that we were building, and um, not surprisingly, 
square root is not a function that um, I, I think that there's a good theory for, or at least I'm, I'm not an expert on that sort of stuff, but we just sort of stuck a few special cases at the beginning of square root, just like a normal implementation would. And um, that seemed to work pretty well for us. Um, <laughs> is this assuming the input function has no side effects? Uh, yes, we are looking at the case of the, um, you know, call by value lambda calculus with errors. So um, that's the, the only effect here is, is going to be errors. And that's, that's uh, important for the theoretical development. Um, and there's sort of different ways you might go about these questions. If you have, if you have side effects, um, in, in, if you're allowed to use side effects in the inputs, then you're going to get, uh, you sort of have more power and more ways to find bugs in the programs that you're testing. And so we're not looking at that here. Um, why not in line F, which would be the effect of running the calls of F and recording the traces before? Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not completely understanding that question. Um, as long as you get, um, I'm, I'd see the author of the question is Simon, so I'm sure he has some very deep thoughts about that I'm just not quite getting in the question. But I mean, as long as you can, you can get these uh, concolic values, you know, the ones that have the provenance, the ones that have the symbolic formulas in them into the program in the right places, then sure, then, then, then we're good. And um, uh, why perform a mixture of concrete symbolic execution and not just a purely symbolic execution? I think the original idea there was that you didn't have, you didn't have to worry as much about the memory blow up. Um, at least that was, I think, the thought um, back in 2005, not, not being one of the original authors there. But um, in, in later times, the people have, that, that, that sort of shifted in um, a very popular tool named CLI actually does something more like symbolic execution and was, um, is a tool that's been built by people who did some early work in, in, um, in concolic testing. So, yeah. Um, so I think that I think that that's not a there's not a simple answer there, but you know just just at a very high level to twenty thousand foot overview when you're doing it symbolically like this you just you run the program once and you finish and then you can make some decision, whereas when you're running it symbolically you sort of keeping all of the decisions at once going and there's sort of engineering trade offs there if not other more deeper trade offs that I'm not sure about. Um, does it work with arbitrary recursion? Can it be expanded to folds and unfolds, anamorphisms and catamorphisms? Yes, yes, I believe so. Um, one, one point I should say about, about that, um, I have been talking about the control flow graph here um, and this, the Concolic engine sort of working its way through it, but um, really what it's seeing is some kind of um, unfolding of the control flow graph into a tree and sort of working its way through that. Um, so I'm not sure if that's where you're coming from. Okay, let's go on to the next chapter. Um, all right, uh, so this, uh, let me say by way of introduction for this, that, that if we stopped at this point where we just did roughly what we described in the, what I described in the previous chapter, we would not be able to find all the bugs in the program. And in order for me to explain the extra power that we're gonna need or the extra tricks we're gonna need, um, I need to bring two inputs into the, into the picture. All right, so here's, um, here's our new, function, which is very similar to our old function. So now we're saying f of x times three should be equal to f of x times two plus three. And so let's see what happens when we try to find the bug on this program. So we have two inputs. So we'll start out again with very basic versions of the simplest possible ones. So x will be zero, but of course, remembering it's x. And f will be the constant function returning zero. Okay, so let's drop in those x's and start to start the program running. So we have um, f of zero super x. And so of course that's going to be zero super y because f always returns zero super y, but we also keep in our little log sitting there zero super x. So we got called with the, the concrete value zero um, that had the symbolic formula x attached to it. And uh, now we can multiply zero times three and still get zero, but with y times three, has the symbolic formula associated with it. And now we're ready to move on to the other call to start working on the argument to the other call of F. So zero times two is zero. 
Um, of course, that's not any old zero, that's zero with the provenance x times two. So that goes into our log. So now we have two entries in our log. They're both concretely zero, but symbolically they're different. And then um, uh, we get the formula that we know we can't solve and we look at our log. And of course, you now you see there's two zeros in the log. So that's not helpful for introducing that con because the function got called both times with the same input. And so we, we can't, if we look only at the concrete values, actually force the function to return different arguments because different results because it's not being called with different arguments. But this is where we can use the SMT solver again because those arguments we got were actually influenced by X. So we can ask the solver, won't you please give me an X such that X and X times two are different from each other. And of course it's happy to oblige and it says one is the input. And now we can run all the same things again and we'll get all the same results. We'll get zero, uh, we'll, get, we'll get that Y should be one, you know, this, the same, same steps we went through before. Um, but I wanna point out here, notice that X's input changed, but it wasn't because we um, somehow did a formula that was directly connected to X somehow. We didn't flip a con branch that was directly connected to X. X changed because X came in through a log, we decided we wanted those two values in the log to be different because we wanted a con branch. And so that sort of forced us to also change X. So that's why X became a one here. All right, so. From this chapter, we learn that we have the log expressions. The, the log expressions have to track the symbolic formulas, not just the concrete ones as they did in the first go. And then we also can use the solver to ensure that the cases are distinct from each other. Okay, now I'll take a look here. Does the concolic tester just try to find new branches, code paths, and see sensible search backward from the errors? Uh, the concolic tester just searches sort of forwards in this sense, yes. Um, and you're absolutely right. It would seem sensible to search backwards from the errors. This will become even more apparent in the next example. And in fact, people do this, um, although I can't say I'm super familiar with literature, that's definitely a thing in the symbolic execution search space world where you kind of try and kind of do symbolic execution somehow backwards to the inputs. Um, not gonna talk about that here, but that's definitely a, a good, that's, that's a thing for sure and a good idea. Um, what if critical program state is in the values, not the program corner? For example, if you use an interpreter. Um, I, I think if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, you need, you need to be able to track how the input is influencing the program and causing the program to sort of do different things. And um, so, so as long as you can do that, you're in good shape and this technique will do the right thing. Um, I'm not sure if you have something more sophisticated in mind than just that question. If you're talking about program state in the sense of mutable state, um, that opens a whole nother can of worms for which the techniques definitely need generalization to what I'm talking about here. I'm not really gonna be able to say anything about that. Um, SMG solvers can be used to model first order functions. Can you handle F applied to its own result? So, okay, so um, I think this is a question about uninterpreted function symbols and how the SMT solvers have a notion of that. And um, that that will not be, if, if that's all that you use to, to work on this, you will not be able to get the completeness result. And um, the, the example in chapter five will demonstrate that. So hold on and, you'll, and I'll, I'll call it out at that moment. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a tool called Cuter for the, that the Erlang people developed as a concolic tester that uses that approach, um, but it, it, can't, it's not, it wouldn't be able to find the, the bug in, in chapter five. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, so um, there's one more trick we need to be able to deal with first order functions as inputs. So let's, uh, let's take a look. Um, and <laughs> this is the biggest kind of hairiest example in the talk. So let's just take a moment to sort of examine its beauty, if you will. And you have my apologies. I couldn't make a simpler example that uh, demonstrates the need for this, this, last, this last trick that we need. Okay, so this is three nested cons and we need them all to be true. So here's the first one. 
It's saying that f of x has to be 11 and f of zero has to be 121. Okay, so if we get that, if we get an f and an x that satisfied that, then good, we move on to the next one. The next one says that f of x plus 10 has to be equal to 121 in order to get through that one. And then we learn that x should be equal to negative 10, which of course the way the concolic, excuse me, the way the concolic tester is working, when we get to this point, this is gonna be kind of like a uh, out from left field, we get completely screwed and kind of that's the whole point of this example, okay? Um, but the goal of the example is to really illustrate the one more piece that we need to be able to deal with first order functions. Okay, so let's take a look at how we get to the point where we uncover that x should be equal to negative 10 and then see how the concolic tester has to be able to deal with that. Okay. Before we do that though, let me just show you that this really does have an input that triggers a bug. And of course, x has to be negative 10 for that to be the case. And f should be equal to 11 times x plus 11. Okay, um, and for those of you who are really good at mental math, we'll, we'll sort of believe and have checked, or not need to believe, but check them for the rest of us, we'll, let's just believe. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, we're hit, we, do the, we can do all the same steps that we did before to get through this and expression. And if we do them, we're going to get this as the solution for X and for F. So let's look at those for a moment. Um, right, we're gonna call f with x, we're gonna call f with zero, so we're gonna get x and zero as our log. Um, then we're gonna, we're gonna ask this, the SMT solver to give us an x that's different than zero, so it'll give us one, and that's how we end up with one here in the input. And then we're going to give two different um, symbolic variables, and I'm running out of variables at the end of the alphabet, so I'm using a and b now for the results. And then pretty quickly, it'll tell us that A has to be 11 and B has to be 121. And then now we're through that first con branch. And you see this X not equal to zero kind of floating in space in red there. Um, that is the constraint we got in order to make the con to be viable. So in order to actually be able to return two different results for the two different calls, we need X not to be not equal to zero. All right, great. So we got through the first one and now it's time to try to get through the second one. And we'll do the same kinds of things. We're gonna get one more entry in the log. We're gonna get um, X plus 10 coming in, which will have the concrete value 11. And then we also collect one more equation sitting over there on the right, X plus 10 is not equal to zero. So, you know, really we would, we would need these to all be pairwise disjoint, the three arms of the cond, but X plus 10 is never X. So I'm just gonna not write that one down to avoid a little clutter. Okay. Um, in, in, in the integers. <laughs> okay, so uh, now, now we hit the whammy. <laughs> All right, x equal negative 10. It's not, right? x was one in this run. So we get 17 instead of getting the error, bummer. But we can use what we did in the first chapter. We can say, okay, we got a false in that position. That was a point that influenced the control flow in the program. Let's see if we can't swap that branch by asking that x be 10. So I'll add this to the constraints we would like the solver to satisfy for us. And then here, let me just remind you where they came from. And of course, if you look at these, you'll see that if x is equal to negative 10, then x plus 10 is not gonna be different than zero. Or in other words, there is no x that um, satisfies these equations because these last two are basically in conflict with each other, which was the point of the example in some sense. But we need those, right? Otherwise we couldn't have returned three different cons. Uh, sorry, we couldn't have returned three different symbolic variables from our three different entries in our table represented in this con here, right? Okay. So what's really going on is that it's not that we need all of them to be different from each other. What we need is a partition of the inputs into some number of arms of a con. And it doesn't have to be this partition, so I put some curly braces into the log to evoke a partition here. It doesn't have to be the partition that you get by making them all be singleton sets. Instead, we can group things together and make different partitions that way, and that'll give rise to different cons, some of which will make sense and some of which won't make sense. Okay, so, right, because we might, it might be two concrete inputs and you can't group those, and the SMT solver will very happily tell us that one will not be equal to two, for example. Um, but let's see, we could group them various ways, so we could, put one and zero together in one piece of the partition. 
and, uh, and the other input x plus 10, which was 11 in this case in the other one. And if we do that, we can get a viable cond and we can run the whole thing again and we won't find the bug. Okay, fine. So let's do it this way. If we put the first one and the second and third together in a partition, then um, we, 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 get the, um, we do get a viable solution and this one actually will lead us to the bug. So um, in particular, we get these set of um, equations here now. So the first and second have to stay distinct because they're in different parts of the partition. And the second and third have to be the same uh, because they're in the same part of the partition, which means that x plus 10 has got to be equal to zero, which is, by the way, great, because that's just what we needed to be able to get through that, con that, that innermost con branch. OK, so the, <laughs> this big example really to just say only one point which is sometimes you have to force distinct calls into your first order function or into your functions into the same branch of the cond and, and into the same entry in our table. And that's sometimes necessary to be able to solve um, to, to find the inputs that trigger the bug. Okay. Simon, yes, that's correct. I think you're trying to answer the question, is there any F that will let this expression return an error? That's correct. Yes, F is intended to be an input to the program that someone outside, and we want to attempt to find bugs in our software. So we're gonna we're going to um, hope that there are no Fs, and then use the compile tester to show us there are in fact there are Fs, and then we'll you know fix bugs, and that'll be great. Um, yeah, sorry for my confusion. Would it be possible to use compile tester to automate exploit development? Yeah. I don't recommend automating exploit development unless you're trying to fix the bugs that lead to exploits, of course. Okay, higher order inputs. Okay, so that we sort of covered first order inputs and now we need to be able to generalize to um, more than just integer to integer inputs. Okay, and, and of course, if you think about this for just a moment, what you'll realize is that if I had, let's say that my, my program accepts an input like G here, the G better call its argument because there might be a bug in there. Okay, so that, that's maybe straightforward and easy to believe and easy to understand. But it turns out there's another reason why G might need to call its input. Okay, and so that's what this example is intended to illustrate. All right, so let's start out with the most basic G. You see that G is supposed to return an integer, so we'll have it just be a constant function returning zero that with the concolic X. And if you just do the same things we've been doing um, that you're, I'm sure, in all old hats at at this point, you will realize that we get x plus x equal to nine as the formula we will end up with controlling that false in that cond. And there is no integer <clears throat> that if you double it, you'll get nine, unfortunately. Excuse me. So what did we do before? Well, we looked at the log, right? And maybe that gave us a way to split what was going on. And here's our log. Um, f is a function, and then it's a function. It doesn't seem very helpful. Okay, and so I'm sure some of you are already thinking to yourselves, oh, my programming language has operations that let me compare functions to each other. Or you're thinking to yourself, oh, a function, that's probably going to be implemented using a closure, which is a pointer. So if I could do pointer comparisons, and, and, and let me just say to you, yes, that will, in fact, um, is that will in fact help you find the bug in this program, but you don't need to do that. Okay. So what is a function in some essence? And oh, I should also point out there are some programming languages that just don't have equality relations on functions quite sensibly. Um, so what is a function? Well, a function is something you can call. So let's call it. Maybe that's a path here to find the bug in this program. Okay. So um, we'll introduce a let to bind the result that comes out of calling our argument f. So I'm going to call it with the input y. So I'll call the variable fy. And of course, now I'm passing a value into the program I'm testing. So clearly, I should pass it in with, you know, I should make up a new variable and pass it in with that variable because it might go into a cond. It might be some, it might end up some in some way that. I will then be able to use the SMT solver to, to, to force the program into more interesting things, into more interesting behavior. And of course, when it comes back, I should log it because, well, that was the whole point of why I made the call 
was to be able to tell whether this is the first call to G or the second call to G so that I can return two different variables so that I can actually get a nine back by adding them together, two integers together. So I'll log them and I get um, Y plus one with the con with concretely one and Y plus two is concretely two. And I'll do the same whole same thing I do before to introduce the, um, the cond here at this point. Um, the SMT solver will be very happy to tell me that zero is in fact already good because zero distinguishes y plus one from y plus two, so I can have my two condarms. And so we get this, um, and then, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll now split my um, constant zero into two constant zeros, one with x and one with z, and now I run this input, and I'll discover that I need x plus z to be equal to nine, which this has a solution, namely one of them is uh, four and five, and we'll find the bug, yay. Okay, so we did a lot of the same things we've been doing in the earlier chapters here, but we did them kind of in different places. So let's take a moment and sort of, if you look at the type structure of the inputs, that gives you some guide to what you're doing, where and why. Okay, so let's go back to our F. We had F that took an integer and returned an integer. And on the input, we did logging and in, with the goal of, of introducing cons, cond expressions. And on the output, we returned concolic variables, fresh concolic variables, you know, as many as we could, or as many as were suitable based on the con that we, need, that we decided to make. Okay, and let's look at what happened now, just now when we did G. So um, we did something similar. So look at the range part of G first, we returned a concolic variable there, just like we did in the range of F. But if you remember how we treated G's argument, that was a lowercase F, right? When we called it, we were supplying an argument into the program. So we gave it a concolic variable because, well, that we might learn something about how the program treats it in, to be able to change the, the actual concrete value of that, of that input. And then when it came back, we did a log and a cond. And we did that because uh, we wanted to be able to return multiple different results there, just in the same way that we wanted to return multiple different results from the capital F. Okay. So there's, there's, it turns out there's a pattern here. So why some places are concolic variables, some of these integers, and some of them are logs and cons. And so which is which? And okay, so I'm sure some of you have encountered this kind of question before in lots of different settings and it's sort of blindingly obvious. And so um, what you do, um, but for those of you who haven't, what you do is you count the number of times you go to the left of an arrow. Okay. And then, you see if that was an even number or an odd number. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if it was an even number, well, return a concolic variable. If it was an odd number, well, do a log and a cond. And, and, and the reason we're counting the number of times we go to the left of an arrow is every time you go to the left, you sort of switching the sense of who's in control of the computation and where values are coming from and to. So values are going from and to the test to the input, then they're going the, the program under test to the input, then, then when you go to the left of the arrow, they're going the other way. And if you switch back, they're going back the other way again. And so you can follow the type structure in this way to keep track of who's supplying values to whom. And if the input is supplying values, you know, in other words, the thing that the concolic tester is making, well, we want concolic variables. And if the program is supplying inputs at that point, well, we want to do logs and cons. And now you just need to follow the type structure to introduce lets or to introduce lambdas in the right, just the right places following this type structure. And then and put in your logs and cons or concolic variables at just those points. Okay, um, so here's the recap. We're going to call into the given functions to distinguish call sites in addition to finding bugs. And this gets us back to the idea of strategy. Now we have a huge number of different strategies that we might have. Not they're not just tables anymore because the pattern of calls that you make into the input are going to affect. Um, that's basically what we'll call the strategy here in general. And so we saw we needed a strategy that involved one call in order to solve that example. And uh, there, there are strategies where you need to make multiple calls because in order to distinguish two particular, or, or say three particular calls into your input, you need to, to sample the function at two different points, say. And there's lots of different combinations like this. So the concolic tester needs to be able to generate more and more calls into the function at more and more different values to be able to uncover um, some differences between them to be able to return symbolic variables to then turn those ultimately into different values to get to the bug. Okay. And the even odd positions 
are, are the way you should think about, you know, who's in charge at that moment of the computation and therefore how does the Kankala tester have to react to that, whether it's in charge or whether it's, it's sort of an observer. Okay. Okay, questions. Does this require trying an exponential, exponential number of partitions? Yeah. Um, you move from flat inputs to functions as inputs. What about pairs or lists as inputs? Maybe an easier stepping stone. Yeah, there's actually, um, and I wish I, I wish I had it at the tips of my fingers to cite work on um, concolic testing with data structures and also with pointers. Um, uh, yes. Do you know an application of this to crypto? No. Perhaps though, that's me, my shortcoming, not the not the research enterprise. Um, why not only add condition of distinction only when results must be different? Second and third inputs in the example in chapter four. Uh, yes, yes. There. Oh, okay. So I think the question is basically getting at the idea that there are heuristics that are important to be able to be uh, to search effectively, and for sure that's the case. Um, in fact, the exponential number of partitions points to that too. Um, and, and it's definitely a good heuristic to try to open up and get as many variables as you can. Uh, so in that sense, there's a heuristic there. There's also noticing that the two different ones can be the same variable. So maybe that's a good suggestion to collapse them. Um, th these are all, I, we have not explored heuristics. We've just sort of, the theoretical development here sort of laid out the search space and showed that the search space has good properties itself. Um, I was expecting to get a con for G whose branches are driven by tables, our concolic approximations for F. Well, so the, 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 the little F that came in was a function that, um, you know, was controlled by the program we're testing. So we don't get to directly ex ex explore it as a table per se, but we are effectively doing what you're saying in the sense that we're sampling that, that function's behavior at certain points. And then when we get enough samples that distinguish it, well, we don't care necessarily what the rest of the table is doing. We're sort of happy that we can sort of see that it's two different functions now, and therefore we can do something different in response. Um, okay, what if we had state? That would be great. Uh, do these ideas generalize? Yeah, I like that's an exciting problem, I think, <laughs> and one I don't have the answer to. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, I'm gonna wrap up by, this was all just like an idea, um, a, an approach, a way of thinking about this problem. And so I wanna just try to end by giving you an actual result we have about that. Okay. Um, and like I said at the beginning, we're sort of aimed at this question of completeness and this, is, this has been theoretical work that we've done so far. And so I wanna just try to state the theorem that we've been able to prove, um, one of the theorems we've been able to prove. Okay, so the, the idea with the statement of the theorem is that um, these operations that we've talked about here in the talk are sufficient to find any error in a small untyped linear calculus model. And assuming of course the SMT solver is good. You know, the SMT solver never says that there's no solution to a problem that actually has a solution, um, which is, you know, we saw earlier questions like uh, the Simon's question about square root that suggests that that's that's an issue too. So, but but because we're sort of studying the generalization to higher order functions, we're we're sort of explicitly cutting that out as a reason that we might fail to find the bug. Okay, and the theorem is actually stated in kind of a sort of operational constructive sort of way. In particular, what the theorem is saying is that if we start from a dumb input and apply changes step by step that that search process, if you make the right decisions by making the right kinds of changes, will lead to any bug that is in the program. Okay, so here are the definitions. Um, I need to define six things in order to be able to state the theorem, so let's go through them. First, we need to have a notion of programs. So this is an, an untyped higher order lambda calculus where we added errors and cons because that's essential to be able to even talk about concolic testing. And just like we did in the examples here, the free variables are gonna be inputs to the program. Um, we have a little sigma, that's our inputs. So it's a, you think of it as a table that maps the free variables to particular inputs that we're gonna run with the, with the program. And we separate these out because we're gonna change sigma a whole bunch and with the same E. Um, then uh, we have the log. 
And um, the log contains three different pieces of information. It contains those control flow points back from chapter one. So what were the symbolic variables at the control flow points in the program under test? It contains the logs that correspond to um, like values coming in to the program. No, sorry, values coming into the input. Those logs that we that we saw many times when I wrote semicolon log in the text. And then actually our log in the theoretical development here also contains information about which branch of the cons in the input that we actually took. So if the input has a con and we get the log because some value came in and we also in the log are gonna record which arm it went into, which branch of the con it went into. Okay. We have two evaluators, a normal evaluator. So you give it an expression and you give it the inputs and it gives you a result. The results are either just a number, they are this, this like, this tag saying you got a function back. And of course, if you wanted to know what that function does, you don't get that information from the evaluator. But in some sense, that's not important because you could just make a different program that called the function to record whatever you wanted to know about that one function. Or you get back an error. Then there's the concolic evaluator, which has all those smarts about provenance of values and does all the logging that I talked about. And so this one produces um, this is the same result as the normal evaluator, but it also produces the log. And then here, evolve, which I'm not going to show you, but this is the kind of the technical heart in, of, of the definitions. So evolve is a function that takes in the log for a particular input. Okay, so they're, they're a matching pair of log and input, and it gives you back a set of new inputs to try. And hiding inside evolve is the SMT solver. So it, it tries to swap the branches of the cons in the program. It tries to separate and merge the conned um, branches in the input. And it also um, has all the different ways you could insert one more call into one of the functions. So in our case of our capital G, it would contain, it would insert one more let that made another call back into that lowercase f that we saw there. So all those possibilities are in the result that comes back from con and they're all the viable ones. So if the, if flipping the con branch didn't work, then we, you know, and the SMP solver says there's no solutions to that. We just don't have that in the, that one in the results. Okay, so with those six definitions out of the way, here's the statement of the theorem of completeness. So for any E, if there exists a sigma that demonstrates an error in the normal evaluator, and none of the this is sort of technical side condition here, that, that sigma itself shouldn't have inputs that have errors in it. So in other words, if you have an error-free input that causes the program under that input to produce an error, then there's like really an error in E itself. Then there's a sequence of inputs and logs that we can search through using Evolve. That's what those four bullet points say. So let's look at the first and last one first. The first one is just saying that the first element in that sequence of inputs and logs, the, the first input is just the, is the dumb one, the same dumb one we've been using throughout the talk. It's got zeros, um, for the constants, it's got um, uh, constant functions, you know, just sort of very dumb inputs, a fixed set of dumb inputs that we know how to make ahead of time without looking at E. And then the last one is saying that the last entry in that sequence actually is a witness to the bug in the normal evaluator. And then the middle two are just sort of connecting all the pieces together. So as we run the ith input, we get the ith log. And furthermore, if we evolve the ith input and ith log together, we're going to get the i plus first input. So at every step, okay, we can get the, um, um, we can use evolve can tell us like if we make good choices by looking at the set of things that evolve returns, which of course this is still a search problem and we're not really saying anything about the, um, you know, search heuristics or uh, good ways to search, but there is a viable search path is what this is saying. Okay. And I, I wanna also say that um, our theoretical development is a, is a bit more complicated than this because there are other properties that we, want that we state and prove about it. Um, so for example, evolve actually has more doodads on it. It returns more results, tells us more about what's going on in ways that are relevant for other theorems that I won't talk about here. And then I also, um, one technical footnote that I'll add to this is that this theorem statement is actually bogus because it doesn't really account for programs that terminate on some inputs and don't terminate on other inputs. Um, but in order to state the theorem properly, I would have had to introduce a bunch of more machinery that I didn't seem worth it to bring the idea across. And so um, the kind of the, the that red footnote there is saying that this is sort of implicitly making an assumption that um, you actually get results. Whereas 
the theorem actually accommodates the fact that some E's might have bugs and might fail to terminate on other inputs. And there's a sort of notion that you might be able to run it and then stop it after a while and get a log back and then do something with that log. And you might need to run it for a little bit longer and, and do something with it and get more information than the log to be able to take the next step in that sequence of um, inputs and logs in the pair. And the, the actual theoretical development that we have and the proofs uh, properly account for all that. Okay. All right. Uh, we also built a prototype because you know it's nice to be able to make sure you actually can find bugs when you do these things. And we built it on top of Rosette, um, which is a fantastic um, uh, SMT solving toolkit for the budding language builder, which is us here. Um, and we used, of course, Racket's language-oriented programming facilities to, to build on top of it. We got a benchmark suite of 115 example programs from a bunch of places in the literature. And um, we're nine short at the moment, although you know the, the, we haven't closed the book on this yet. Um, the shortcomings all have to do with, with various features that our uh, prototype can't handle at the moment. Um, and uh, I should also say that that second paper in the list there actually collects most of the examples together and it's, it, it provides a benchmark suite and that's where we started from. And so these other citations are here because that's where those programs came from ultimately. Okay, so let me just leave my last slide here saying, yay, can call it testing. It's, it's a really cool idea and uh, a lot of fun to think about and experiment with and play with. Um, and if, if these ideas in this talk um, have sort of piqued your interest, uh, I wanna point you to two different things. One is Rosette, which I mentioned earlier that we used to build our prototype. Rosette is a toolkit for giving, building solver-aided programming languages um, in Racket, taking advantage of Racket's uh, language-oriented programming facilities. Definitely a very cool system and fun thing to play with uh, if you want to explore these ideas more. And then the other place I would point you to is CLI, which is a symbolic testing engine built on top of LLVM. Um, and uh, so it's not concolic in the sense that it runs the program once, looks at the provenance, and then decides how to run it again. It's sort of running the program all the different ways at once. Okay, um, so that's a that's kind of a big technical difference, but the the ideas and this 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 information about keeping track of how this value is influenced that's all it's all there in CLI as well, um, and CLI is also just a fantastic piece of software that's well worth your time if you want to look into these ideas more. And of course, that's uh, Shu Hong and Christos, who are my collaborators on this project and who did the lion's share of the work here. So lucky me gets to talk about it. Okay, um, we have a few more minutes maybe for questions. Um, I, guess, I guess John will let me know when we run out. Um, since fixed point can be defined in the untyped lambda calculus, does that mean your completeness result applies to recursive functions? Yes. The even odd position is the same as in your previous work on higher order contracts. Is that a coincidence? Is there any insight of that connection? Um, I don't think it's a coincidence in the sense that it's somehow fundamental to just thinking about programming and how functions work. Um, I, I would say that my familiarity with me made me realize that that was going to come up pretty early on in, in, the, in, the, in the work. Um, sorry if I missed it. Does your program handle intero intero bool cond f non terminating function two else error? Um, so, I mean, yes, uh, the theorem does uh, does account for programs that fail to terminate. If that's the generator thing in your question, I think this program doesn't have an error in it. However, um, at least you know if that if that was racket code. Um, so the theorem doesn't say anything about that program. Does the evaluation order that you use for your lambda calculus affect the results of the concolic testing? Yes. Um, we, we did it with a call by value. Um, I suppose one could also redo the development with, with call by need or call by name. Um, I, I, I would be surprised if it would be, if it would be impossible to redo it with that in that way. Can you say anything about the number of steps required? Uh, it's finite. <laughs> so not, I can't say a lot, unfortunately. Um, can we find your prototype if it's available? Is there a place we can find your full proof? Um, 
they're not we're, they're not currently publicly available. But if you are interested and have uh, would like to read them or say something about them, please uh, send me an email. Be delighted to uh, delighted to share and get your feedback about them. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, did you run into limits the SMT solver in the experiments? No, we didn't. In our prototyping, no, we didn't. Um, follow up, would it have an error if f equals lambda x false? So I think you're thinking about something where you're calling call by, na call by name. And if I just take your program and sort of thunk up, thunkify it in the in the usual sort of a way, then it would it would be able to find the value, no, find the bug, no problem. Um, I mean, the, the, yeah. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Robbie. That was really fascinating. Um, yeah. Let's thank Robbie. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks very much for giving a talk. And um, uh, next week, let me remind you all that we will have Stephanie Vierich speaking in the seminar series. So uh, tune in, same time, same channel. Thank you very much. And we have ended the stream. <laughs>